What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Bootleg Football Podcast. Another big show. Uh, honestly, going into this week, we really didn't know what the show was going to be about. And then all of a sudden, the football gods graced us with a ton of huge contract signings over the last 24 hours. So all of a sudden, we have a full show, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, so we're going to get into talking about these two huge tight end deals, uh, a big, big offensive line signing up in Buffalo, and one of the uh, last remaining big pieces has finally fallen in free agency with Everson Griffin signing in Dallas. So a lot to get to today. Uh, EJ, before we get into that, though, how are you doing and what are you drinking? I am just fine. I, too, am extremely glad for the NFL because, yeah, we had a conversation last night via text like, hey, what should we talk about this week during the show? Well, I guess we could kind of talk about this. And maybe we could patch together that. And we said, yeah, yeah, we'll make that work. And we went to bed and then we got up this morning and it's like George Kittle signs. Woo. <laughs> Travis Kelsey signs. Woo. <laughs> he sent me another text. Now it's Dawkins. Everson Griffin's in Dallas. I was like, well, I guess that's it. Show's full. Close the gates. We're ready to go. (laughs) So I'm pretty happy about that. But what am I drinking? I have a bourbon. I actually made it out to the liquor store, mask on, and picked up some uh, supplies. And this is Black Ridge bourbon from Louisville, Kentucky. And my first time having it. Starts off with just a sort of small note of honey, making you think, oh, this is going to be very smooth. Nope, (laughs) nope, nope. That's super oaky bourbon. Um, This is this is big boy bourbon, and it will remind you of what you're drinking. Um, I think you'd be really into it because your love of peated scotches um, has a very similar back end to it. And um, I'm enjoying it, Uh, taking it over, you know, one cube of ice and uh it's good stuff but uh not for the faint of heart and i cannot imagine drinking three or four fingers worth of it like one one and a half is just fine so good sipping bourbon in, but i'm going straight down the middle of americana tonight and backing it up with a pbr long neck because those were also on sale and nothing i love better than a pbr in a bottle uh what do you have so uh i'm a little bit bougie with it tonight not gonna lie <laughs> I, oh, so uh, we've swapped. My hoity-toity yeah. Northwest beer taste has has slidden to the southern end. Slidden. Wow. I'm making up words already. This is ugly. Well, you did start drinking about an hour before the show. So. <laughs> it is true. I started drinking when we started writing, which is a huge mistake. I should start drinking when we start recording. But what do you have that's so bougie? So uh, I don't know if you've ever made a Manhattan with uh, a Whistle Pig 10, but it's phenomenal and keep in mind a whistle pick 10 is usually the scene is like that's that's a rye that you sip you don't really throw it into a cocktail it's it's pretty damn good rye but uh i didn't have my my written house with me i don't even know where the hell i put it i might have finished it and which is normally kind of my workhorse rye uh you know for <laughs> i might have finished it i don't I remember i don't know it's pandemic <laughs> i can't keep track anymore so I was like, eh, whatever, I'll throw in the whistle pig. And I, I did a little Carpano Antica in there. You do like a two to one ratio for Carpano Antica sweet vermouth. Um, and then I, I, some people like to use only Angostura. Some people like to only use orange bitters. I use both. So I do two dashes Angostura, one dash orange bitters. And maybe I'm not uh, super bougie because I don't have any brandied cherries on me. But uh, it's just just the alcohol for me. No, no garnish on it. But damn, this is a hell of a Manhattan. And if you like Manhattans, which, you know, it's one of the staple cocktails in the whiskey world, uh, try it with Whistle Pig 10, because good lord, this is delicious. And you get on me for my beer tastes. Hey, man. The, <laughs> the world's ending. Right. Uh, enjoy it while you can. <laughs> I am I am not going to short you your bougie cocktail. I, I've had Whistle Pig and enjoy it. I have not had it in a Manhattan. That's mostly because I don't really enjoy manhattans but no whistle pig very solid stuff so we've uh both got some solid bourbons i'm backing it up with a good old american classic because you know they earn that blue ribbon uh but we have a lot of blue ribbon deals to talk about and the first one is george kittle and yeah he lit it up uh not unexpected i'll say um san francisco is going to give him a five-year 75 million dollar deal signing bonus of 18 million includes 30 million guaranteed at signing 
40 million in total guarantees overall for the contract. Uh, what do you think about the Kittle deal? So there are, let me count, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 wide receivers in the league that make more money than George Kittle. Uh, that's probably about seven or eight more than I expected when he signed this deal. I thought he was going to get way more than 15. I thought we were going to be looking at pushing 18, which would have made him about a top five wide receiver. That would have tied him with Tyreek Hill um, at about fifth overall in wide receiver. Just when you consider how important he is to that offense, not just in the pass game, but in the run game too, uh, I thought he was not just going to set the record for tight ends, but absolutely shatter it in the same mold that Pat Mahomes just did with quarterbacking. So for him to only get 15 a year uh, is is a hell of a deal for the Niners. We know the cap is going to go up um, pretty substantially uh, as, as this deal goes on for the next five years. And honestly, by the time some of these other young tight ends coming up after him sign their deals that are not as good as him, this is going to seem like a bargain. So absolutely phenomenal signing by the Niners. John Lynch continues to kill it. I think he's already one of the better general managers in the league, believe it or not. And he's he still hasn't even fully hit his stride yet. Um, I, I don't really care that it's, you know, 40 million in total guarantees. Like th- this is a, in my opinion, future Hall of Fame, you know, type talent. And locking him up for this long at a relatively team-friendly price, great, great job. Yeah, Kittle is a very special player, and when Kittle gets talked about, his draft status always comes up that he ended up getting drafted way down there, and everybody says, nobody saw this coming. Well, that's not exactly true. I went digging for receipts today, as painful as it was. Um, I was a big Kittle fan. I ended up talking about that on a couple of podcasts. I reached out to my editor at Windy City Gridiron. Lester Wilfong, and he had had me on his T-Formation Conversation podcast uh, before it was on the SB Nation Network, and we he had asked me at the end of one of the podcasts pre-draft, we were talking about offensive options for the Bears, and he said, you know, EJ, is there anybody else you like? And for some reason I said, there's this guy out of Iowa, he blocks like a maniac, I really <laughs> love him, he's hard-nosed, I think he'd fit really well in Chicago. You know, and this was before Kittle's combine performance, because that's really when people started to know who Kittle was. But obviously it didn't move the needle that much because he still got drafted due to his lack of passing production at Iowa, which is more system based. Now we know not not ability based. He certainly has that ability. And Shanahan knows how to employ all those gifts, right? The gifts in the passing game, certainly the gifts in the running game. You put use check and Kittle together. It's it's pretty much a nightmare. That's two guys that block like offensive linemen that can move a whole lot faster than offensive linemen. So yeah, cornerstone deal. Yeah. <laughs> cornerstone deal for San Francisco. Good for Kittle getting paid. I too am surprised that he didn't get more types um wide receiver money almost. Uh basically reset the tight end market and you still think he's underpaid. So it's a little odd, but the NFL is very uh, traditional on its pay scale structures, and it clings very tightly to these positional designations. And we see this with linebackers and defensive ends, right? There's a difference in the pay scale, obviously a difference in the pay scale between wide receiver and tight end, although their roles are not that much different in the modern NFL. Certainly Kittle blocks much more than your average receiving tight end. But um, folks like, you know, Evan Engram, who's not a great blocker for the Giants, but a tremendous receiving threat when he's healthy. You know, you could say that he's worth, quote unquote, as much as a slot receiver, but the NFL doesn't see it that way. They hold very stringently to these positional designations for sort of uh, top cap for ability to pay out at a positional value. I wonder how much longer that's going to last, but um, it'll probably have to be negotiated in the next collective bargaining agreement because we seem pretty well set for now. But it is a bit strange for a guy to completely reset the market for his own position and still seem a little bit underpaid. But uh, that's George yeah, Kittle. Yeah, well, in a I mean, for for context, for for context, um, the previous highest paid uh, tight end, Hunter Henry, was at ten point six million a year. That was the market before this deal was signed. And it is rare 
to see somebody get paid, what is that, 150% uh, value of the previous high, and still be underpaid. It is rare that you can look at a guy and be like, oh, would you rather have George Kittle at $15 million a year or Zach Ertz at 8.5 and still say George Kittle? Like, that's... It's not often that you can look at that and be like, yeah, I'll I think he's actually worth double what another great player is. Like that is how far ahead of most of the tight end field that he is that you can look at another guy who recently within the past couple years set an NFL record for most receptions by a tight end in a single season and still be like, oh yeah, the other guy's worth twice as much as him. Like that's that just speaks to how great a talent he is. And honestly, the only other guy in the league that I, I think even comes close to his value, ironically, on the same day, hours apart, signed a contract that comes close to his value. Now, we don't have exact guarantees. We don't even have exact numbers, period, uh, for Travis Kelsey's new deal. But what we do know is that it adds four years on top of his previous deal for $57 million-ish. Uh, and it will be able, it's, it's reported somewhere between... 14 and 15 million per year. The speculation I saw was 14.3 per year in new money average, which again, uh, you know, shatters what was yesterday's, you know, top deal in Hunter Henry at 10.6, um, but still doesn't make him quite as high as George Kittle. And I, I'm okay with that because again, you know, Kelsey's 30, I think right now he's going into his age 30 season. So this deal essentially makes him a chief for life. Um, but as it stands right now, he's the only guy in the league, not Gronk, not Ertz, not Henry, not any of them that can even be in Kittle's shadow, let alone in the same room as him. So again, that's a very fair deal considering his age. It's his third contract, which is typically not a market resetter, historically speaking. Um, and both of these deals, I think, knock it out of the park. Uh, one, one note I do want to do on Kelsey's deal, cause people are saying where the hell are Chiefs getting the money? Um, Aaron Schatz made a great point on Twitter. It's a lot easier to say, quote unquote, the cap is fake and that those numbers don't matter when it comes to contract extensions and not signing new players to new deals. Because with extensions, then you can get real creative with bonuses and push off the money to later years, which they don't have space right now, but they are going to have space in the future. So uh, it, it's a lot easier to do this with a player that's already on your team than say if it was another team going out and trying to sign Travis Kelsey that would have to pay more up front. So uh, yes, I, I know the cap is fake when it comes to this, but only as it relates to extensions, not to actual free agency. Meh. <laughs> the cap <laughs> is fake. Uh, and, you know, yes, it's easier with extensions, but my favorite point about that, um, I saw Schatz's tweet, uh, but it was from Andrew Brandt who said, the uh, we don't have cap space is the NFL's version of she's just not that into you. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a bad point actually <laughs> no it's true like when somebody says oh we'd love to sign him we really think he's a great player but uh we just uh don't have the money and literally the kansas city chiefs who had like 177 dollars in cap space that's like four copies of madden and they have re-signed mahomes jones and kelsey in the space of a month uh, so yeah, the cap's fake. Uh, I mean, it comes due eventually, but, uh, creative general managers, um, capologists can do this. They can find money, move it around, push it off. Like you said, not forever. It does come due. We've seen, you know, cap implosions, but again, folks have gotten a lot smarter about how to manage it. And the bottom line is if you want to resign somebody, <clears throat> a Rob in Chicago, you should do it. Yeah, and also, uh, this is a shot across the bow to Cowboys fans, by the way. Yeah, it's yeah. We can talk about that in a little bit, but both of these deals, it's amazing that basically, again, top two players at a position, tight end, sign contract, major contract extensions, uh, you know, market resetting contract extensions within hours of each other, within basically about a half million of each other per year. Um, to keep themselves with their teams for a long time, Kittle for an extra five years, uh, Kelsey for a total of six seasons, two on his existing deal and four on the extension. So he's, again, most likely to retire a chief 
Um, well deserved for him. But pretty interesting that on a quote unquote no news day. And the other thing is there just haven't been a lot of extensions being signed, period. And then suddenly today the coffers just fly open. Kittle, Kelsey, Dawkins, um, Everson Griffin, who's been on the free agent market forever, ends up signing. He didn't sign a big money deal, but um, kind of no news to all the news in one day. Very, very strange uh, goings on in the NFL today, but happy to see it. Uh, Certainly fills up our podcast for the night. That's for sure. Well, my theory, at least, for the reason why we've seen such kind of a flurry of signings is players are finally in camp. You know, they're, they're getting checked out by doctors. They're actually in the building. I, I kind of feel like it was, uh, even though everybody was doing Zoom meetings and everything over the offseason, I kind of feel like now that these guys are actually in the building, I feel like these negotiations are really taking place. And that was that was my theory of why all of a sudden we're getting all these signings. I mean, normally it happens every single year. You know, guys get in the building and then all of a sudden agents and GMs start talking and everything like that. Like, there's usually once a year there's a big trade right before the season or there's a big signing right before the season this year we got both we got the Jamal Adams trade and we got a bunch of signings so I think just the fact that players are finally reported and doing football stuff in buildings is is kind of why we're seeing a a bunch of movement here but uh, fascinating fascinating stuff and I do want to take a moment here before we get into the other two major signings that just happened this week to thank our sponsor for the show, because uh, you guys are apparently supporting the hell out of Purple Mattress, so they keep coming back to us, and we really appreciate that, because we like being able to do this for a job. So thank you guys for supporting Purple, and thank you, Purple, for sponsoring us once again. And if you're new to the show and you haven't heard about Purple, they are the most innovative sleep system on the market and have been for over 15 years now. And that's all because of their unique patented technology, the Purple Grid. The Purple Grid, if you don't know what it is, it's over 1,800 open air channels that keep you cool and comfortable throughout the night within your mattress. And they're all highly flexible to relieve pressure on your body, no matter your size and no matter how you sleep. I can tell you from experience when they kind of sent me and EJ the samples and I got to feel it for myself, it looks weird. I'm not going to lie. It looks really weird. But when you actually feel it for yourself, it is extremely supportive. The vertical channels don't look like they can support weight, but then you feel it and you're like, oh, okay, I get it now. This material is freakishly strong and it's not hot at all. It's It doesn't look like it's supposed to, but it it really works. I, I can attest to that. So it's it's a really great mattress. And in fact, Purple is so confident in what I'm saying and they're so confident in their product that every single order comes with a 100-night risk-free trial. Every mattress also ships for free and is delivered right to your door. And at the end of your trial, if you're not completely satisfied, they will come pick up your mattress at no cost to you. So if you want to try it out for yourself, go to purple.com slash bootleg10 and use promo code bootleg10. And for a limited time with that code, you'll get 10% off any Purple mattress order of $200 or more. Again, that's purple.com slash bootleg10, promo code bootleg10, for 10% off any order of $200 or more. Terms and conditions apply. Thank you again to Purple. And with that, uh, let's kind of move over to some blue, white, and red and talk about a major offensive line deal up in Buffalo, where after only three years in the league, Deion Dawkins got a huge extension, four years, $60 million, 34 guaranteed, runs through the 2024 season. And I got to say, this almost, again, kind of seems like he's being underpaid relative to the rest of the tackle market. I mean, we've seen Laramie Tunsil shattered it last offseason, getting 20 million or 20 plus million. I can't remember the exact number, but it was in the 20s uh, per year when he was kind of holding Houston over a barrel. And Dawkins, who I expected to get in that same range, considering his production, is only getting 15 a year, which is just such a good deal. Like I don't know how they were able to pull this off. He's been extremely durable. And just when you look at his efficiency as a pass protector, not just last year, but his entire career, like in, in two of his first three seasons, he allowed 28 pressures or less. That is elite. In last year, there was only 32 tackles to play at least 900 snaps. Out of all those guys, Dawkins allowed the ninth fewest pressures in the league at, again, only 28. That's less than two per game. He's been incredibly efficient. He's been dirt cheap so far, which, again, I thought he was going to go for a bigger payday considering, you know, his second-round pick. They're not making that much money. Um, he, he's never missed a game in his career. He's long. He's strong. He's technically proficient. I mean, he's he's kind of exactly what you want 
in in a developmental second round left tackle that comes in and shatters expectations. So again, to get him at 15 million a year when the going rate was 25 percent higher than that, I mean that is uh, that's a hell of a deal by Buffalo, and I I truly can't believe they made that work. Yeah, as as much praise as you heaped on John Lynch, Brandon Bean deserves a fair amount of it as well here. Uh, you know, the balance is $34 million guaranteed, more than half the deal um, goes right into Deion Dawkins' pocket. But for what he is and the way the NFL, again, values his position, it's stunningly low. And uh, mm-hmm. he's not a huge name, but his production, if you look at what he has done, what he has allowed, the fact that he allowed that few pressures... Um, protecting a guy like Josh Allen, who was new-ish to the league, he's been in a couple of years, moves around really well, but he's also somewhat erratic in the pocket. He's gotten better at that. He has stabilized, certainly over the last season compared to his first season. However, Dawkins being that consistent this early in his career certainly could have granted him a bigger payday. The fact that Bean got him locked up through 2024, yeah, he had to pay over half for guaranteed money, but considering, like you said, it's 25% below what the set of the market is, that's a great deal, and it's only going to look better as the cap goes up. We assume the cap will go up. Might go down this year. We'll see. But overall, he's the fifth highest paid left tackle in the NFL. He's the seventh highest paid overall offensive tackle, but that's literally only until the next tackle signs, right? Every tackle that is at the top of the market is going to push that number up and up. And two and three years from now, when this deal still has a year or two to go, it's going to be incredibly reasonable. So great job by Brandon Bean and the Buffalo Bills. Yeah, I just I was seeing some some chatter on Twitter. You know, Bills Bills fans know how good he is, but I was seeing some chatter on Twitter saying, you know, why are you paying a quote unquote average offensive tackle? Uh, you know, 15 million a year. And that just goes to show how many people don't watch the Bills every week because if Deion Dawkins is an average offensive tackle, uh, then the quality of the average offensive lineman in the NFL is extremely high because he is a, he's not average. He is way, way, way above average. Literally his entire career, he's averaging two pressures given up a game. That is insane. Like I remember, um, you know, Julian Davenport, who I think was drafted the same year as him, uh, also super toolsy guy, you know, 35 inch arms, just like Deion Dawkins, when he came into the league and he was allowing, you know, more than double the amount of pressures as a starting left tackle. They were both thrown in fairly early in their careers. Um, and that that is the difference. You know, that is the difference between averaging two pressures a game and five pressures a game. And those extra three pressures, guess what? That can be the difference between a 60-yard touchdown or a sack fumble on third down that loses you the game. So he's way, way above average as a left tackle. You know, is, is he the most athletic dude in the world? No, he's not Ronnie Stanley. But Ronnie Stanley's a freak in nature. But what he is is he's super long. He's got great hands. He's got great power. He's really smart. He's really good communicator, um, always in the right spot on stunts. I mean, he's not an elite run blocker, but he's a good run blocker. Like, this is not an average offensive tackle. This is a high, high quality offensive tackle that is now going to be protecting Josh Allen's blind side for his entire rookie you know, contract and going into his second contract if he gets one. Uh, one of the most important things to surround your young quarterback with to ensure his success. And, and again, I all credit to the Bills front office for – really giving Josh Allen zero excuses. You've got a good offensive line now. They're locked up. We got Stephon Diggs. We drafted some bigger body receivers. You've got Singletary and Moss in the backfield. You know, you've got continuity on the coaching staff. There is no excuse left. And the division's weaker this year too because Brady's out of it. Like, if the Bills don't win this division and if Josh Allen doesn't improve, then you might as well get rid of him next year because this is the ideal scenario for him. And if he doesn't get better, or if at least if he doesn't become what we think he can become this season, then you might as well just start over. Yeah, left tackle, super key for a young quarterback and really the development overall of the offense because as so goes Josh Allen, 
you know, as goes Josh Allen, so goes the rest of the Bills offense. And if Josh Allen's on his backside, uh, the offense isn't going anywhere. And if you have to revert to relying on Singletary and Moss to create all your offense because you don't have any time for Josh Allen to drop back and use that big arm, you're sort of playing yourself against your strengths or limiting your own strengths and not allowing them to to move you down the field the way you thought they would when you invested, you know, a high round draft choice in Josh Allen. So left tackle, super important. Deion Dawkins, definitely not average. I I don't know. Do you find this? I find this fairly often that the average, I, I, I would say the average NFL fans ability to understand what average is as it pertains to offensive line play is, uh, I would conservatively call that not great. <laughs> well, there's 10 fan bases that are all convinced they have the worst offensive line. You know, it's, it, it, trust me, I've seen worst offensive lines before. Uh, and Texans fans, you're not it. You know, you're not great, but I'm, I'm calling out my own fan base here. Houston's not the worst offensive line in the league. Laramie Tunsil allowed fewer pressures than fewer pressures than Deion Dawkins did. You know, Titus Howard, when he was healthy, was a good right tackle. Like they had problems staying healthy, sure, but it, it, Houston is perennially one of those fan bases that are convinced that they legitimately have the worst offensive line in the league. And it's like maybe a couple of years ago. Now, no. You know, I look at Cincinnati, they're convinced they have the worst offensive line. I look at Arizona, they're convinced they have the worst offensive line. It's like, it's not every team can be a bottom five offensive line, no matter what you think it is. And I, it's almost like every time a quarterback takes a bad sack, they automatically think they're garbage up front. It's like, that's not how it works, guys. Like, that's why I always preach having NFL game pass is important. So you can actually go back and watch how sacks happen, because honestly, a lot of them, they're on the quarterback. They're not on the line. Yeah, it is. That's a tremendously important point. And, and being a Chicago fan, everyone is convinced that Charles Leno is an absolute bottom five left tackle, that he's garbage and that paying him an extension was the wrong thing to do. And if you look at both, like you said, the tape, the game film of Charles Leno and his stats, Charles Leno is dead average. He is like 16th ish in the league. <laughs> Pretty much. Which on, is the definition of average. That is right down the middle of the meter, right? He is an average left tackle, which is still a very hard thing to find, right? Someone who is 6'4", 6'5", 320 pounds, 34 plus inch arms, uh, you know, the dancing bear routine, can move his feet, can handle speed, can handle power, um, singles up on usually a team's best pass rusher one-on-one -on -one, week after week. And again, has to be consistent because that one play can be the difference between the 60 yard touchdown and, you know, the fumble on third down. It's a very unforgiving position. There are just not that many guys in the world that can do it. And if you have a guy that can do it at the 15th or 16th best level in the world, you're doing okay, especially if you've signed him to a team friendly contract like Charles Leno. So, you know, but people are absolutely convinced he's garbage. He needs to be replaced. Like they just grow on trees and you can go out and pluck another one and they're just all over the place. And those two things are not true. A, Charles Leno is not the worst. And B, you can't just go out, find somebody on the street, plug them in and have them be that good. So, it, this comes up over and over again that people think their offensive line or a certain player on their offensive line is well below average, and he's either average or, like in Deion Dawkins' case, uh, well above average. Yeah, uh, everybody should learn a lesson from Chiefs fans who were trashing Eric, Eric Fisher for being, again, average to slightly above average, which is about where he is uh, in terms of left tackles. Um, and, and they were lamenting his contract and everything like that. And then he got hurt and all of a sudden Cam Irving was left tackle and they're like, Oh shit. Uh, okay. <laughs> now we that's know. why we, that's why we pay him. Cause yeah, he gets beat, but does he get beat every five plays? No, Cam Irving does. <laughs> so it's, it's important to have at least average, you know, offensive tackles. And again, Deion Dawkins is above average, but paying him 15 million a year, even if he was average, Completely fair because it is a necessary uh, it's a necessary thing to have. Now, flipping it over to the other side in terms of somebody who's paid to feast on left tackles, Everson Griffin just got six million to go join that Dallas D line, which, you know, we were kind of running through it before the show, looking at the rotation they've got. And 
I mean, a third down package of Demarcus Lawrence, Gerald McCoy, you know, potentially Neville Gallimore, who I'm assuming would play over Dontari Poe on third downs. And then either, you know, Everson Griffin, maybe mix in some some Bradley and I here and there on third downs. I mean, now now you're cooking with a real good pass rush on third downs. Um, I, I love this deal. I'm honestly shocked the Seahawks didn't match it. I thought they would. Like, I thought they'd be the main player for Everson Griffin because they desperately need someone like him. But great, great snag for Dallas. Yeah, so it's a one-year deal, max of $6 million. Base salary is $3 million. He played all the games last year uh, after not playing uh, all the games in 2018. So his roster bonuses are going to be likely to be earned, which means they'll count against the cap. Um, likely cap hit will be probably 5.3 is what they're estimating because um, there are some unlikely to be earned accelerators in there that could get it up to the total max of $6 million. Uh, But to get a player... At this point, um, getting close to what looks like going to be the season start of Evan Gr- uh, Everson Griffin's caliber for a one-year flyer of $5.3 million when guys who are producing similar results at the position are getting 18 20 25 at the top end is a tremendous deal for the Cowboys, and he fits their system. He's not some slight mm-hmm. speed rusher that only has one move around the edge, uh, and if that gets stymied, he's in trouble. He's decent against the run. He's not a tremendous player against the run, but he's very, very solid. Again, not at all sad to see him leave the NFC North. He's got good power, plays decently against the run, has a vicious spin move. And, um, yeah, who's the person that he <laughs> just victimizes at least twice a year with that spin move? Oh, yeah, it's the Cowboys left tackle. So if anybody's happy to see Everson (laughs) Griffin end up on the Cowboys, it's that he has to face him in practice, uh, but he's not going to have to face him in game situations. So really good deal for the Cowboys. Tremendous scheme fit. um, Gives Demarcus Lawrence, well, takes pressure off Demarcus Lawrence um, and is going to give him some production for uh, basically peanuts at this point of the NFL, you know, schedule and landscape. The thing... Uh, I, I saw a great tweet from Arif Hassan, uh, huge in Vikings Twitter. If, if you don't follow Arif, you absolutely should. Really, if you follow any football at all, he's he's one of the best doing it. Um, and he had an interesting stat that he tweeted out. Weeks 1 through 12, Everson Griffin was 5th in pressures per game. He had a monster start to the season. I mean, multiple games, 8, 9, 11 pressures to start the year. Was just absolutely destroying everyone. Then after the bye week, weeks 13 through 17, he was 60th in the league in pressures per game. And I think that really was kind of showing his age towards the end of the season where he just flat out ran out of gas. So I think it's important for the Cowboys to not load him up with, you know, 50 to 60 snaps a game like Minnesota was doing early in the year uh, because they had to really. And really, you know, mix in an eye a lot. Uh, if I, I don't know what Crawford's injury is, Tyrone Crawford, but he's on the pup now. Um, when he comes off the pup, again, you want to get him some snaps. Even Alden Smith, if he even makes the roster, give him some snaps. Uh, you know, Dorrance Armstrong. Like, give, give Griffin maybe 30 to 40 a game, not 50 to 60. Keep him fresh all year long and just have him be that flamethrower off the edge when you really need him to be. Uh, and, and I think he can really pay big dividends because, again, he's still got it. He, he still can can really rush the passer, but a, an older body like him that's seen a lot of damage over the years, like you have to keep somebody like that fresh. He's not a spring chicken anymore. And I think Dallas is uniquely positioned with their rotation to keep him fresh, which is why I think this is going to work really, really well. Now, I will ask you, because you're a Bears fan, um, he is Griffin is replacing Robert Quinn in Dallas, who is now on the Bears, five years, 70 million, 30 million guaranteed, even though it's really only a two year deal. Like they can completely get out of it after two years and they're fine. Uh, when you're looking at, because Quinn is a, in my opinion, a better player than Griffin at this stage in their careers, a little bit younger, his pressure rates higher. You know, Griffin's getting pressure every about eight and a half snaps. Quinn was getting it about once every seven snaps, which, believe it or not, is a huge difference over the course of a season. So even though Quinn is a more effective pass rusher, is he worth that huge cap hit on the second year of his deal 
that the Cowboys are not going to have to deal with because it's essentially only one year deal for Griffin. Um, it, it, when you when you take the money into account, who is actually a better signing? Is it Quinn in Chicago or is it Griffin in Dallas? Yeah, this is a great question, and the juxtaposition is just so stark because literally one one guy replaces the other guy at the exact same spot in the defense. So if you look at that $70 million number, which is the funny money number that, that gets reported and agents love to have out there in the press, it looks completely lopsided, and the answer would be, oh, it's Griffin, of course. But if you dig into it a little bit more, I'm not going to say that it's uh, completely equal, but it's a lot more equal. So the funny thing to start off with is Quinn and Griffin's cap hits in 2020 are almost identical. Uh, the max for Griffin is six. Quinn is making 6.1. So for the first year, 2020, you really have to line them up sort of apples to apples. And again, Quinn, a better pass rusher, a little bit younger, produces at a slightly higher rate. Uh, the needle goes towards Quinn, but with the contract Quinn signed, you don't get year one without year two, as you said. Uh, and Chicago has the potential out after two years with Quinn, which they are likely going to have to take because Ryan Pace has built himself a cap situation where the window is largely now, uh, I would say like a year and a half, right? If you're doing the over under, he might be able to squeeze out two more years worth of window. But the other thing is he doesn't have a settled option at quarterback. And as we all know, that is a high dollar proposition. So He's got a year or two more before they're going to have to start blowing up some salary. So it's very unlikely that Quinn gets the back end years on that deal. A, because he's going to start to get into 33, 34, 35 years of age and the cap hits get absor exorbitant. I'm talking 16, 17 million dollars a year, um, which the Bears are just purely not going to be able to afford. So Chicago really has that potential out after two years. The totals after two years would be 30 million. That's pretty much the guaranteed 30.1. Um, they'd have, they would have had Quinn for two years at that point. So roughly 15 million a year. The one thing hanging around their neck would be 9.3 million of dead cap. Now that sounds like a lot and it is, but when you're talking about pass rushers and a cap that keeps increasing, it's not as bad as it used to be. But that would be the totals for Quinn. Two years, 30 million, 9.3 million dead cap if they cut bait after two years. Now, that's pretty interesting. If you look at Griffin, he's talking about a max of 6 million this year. But if he goes out and produces like they hope he will, if they use that load management strategy and he balances out to Marcus Ware and all the young guys come along and Dallas is a pass rushing force and say, say Griffin goes out and gets 13, which is a good number for a pass rusher, right? That's a very productive year for an edge rusher. Dallas is not getting him back for $6 million a year, even though he's a year older next year. With the market being set at 20 to 25, they're not going to have to pay him that either because he's going to be a 33-year-old pass rusher at that point, but they're not getting him for any $6 million. They're going to have to pay him 15, probably $18 million a year, plus a little bit maybe guaranteed or signing bonus, and they'll have to dress it up maybe as a two-year deal. So, Again, if you average out those numbers, you take the $6 million that he's likely to earn this year and say mm, $18 million next year, you're talking about $24 million over two years uh, with likely a little bit of dead cap, but probably not the nine point three that we're talking about for Quinn. So, you know, is the difference in production worth it for, say, $24, $25 million bucks a year or $30 million bucks? You know, uh, sorry, $24 or $25 million bucks for two years or $30 million bucks for two years? that Quinn's deal is likely going to be. Mm, at that point, it starts to look a whole lot more even than $6 million or $70 million. So I like the Quinn signing, especially because they have Mac on the other side. I like the Griffin signing because they have Demarcus Lawrence on the other side. The difference is Chicago paid a bunch of extra money for security. We don't know exactly what this season's going to be. We don't even know if it's going to get completed. We hope, as NFL football fans, that it will. Uh, but Dallas is willing to roll the dice for a low dollar, sort of no impact, but no security deal. Chicago wanted at least two years worth of Quinn, his 30-year-old uh, and 31-year-old seasons. They paid quite a bit more to do that, um, but he is a slightly better pass rusher. So I think it's, I think it's a wash. I know that's a terrible answer. Uh, but it's a whole lot better looking than 70 million. Chicago got fleeced and Dallas got a deal. Well, hell, I, I wouldn't even 
say 13 sacks would get him a lot of money. I think even 10 sacks, which he was on pace to get before he, you know, ran mm-hmm. out of gas in the last month of the season. You know, he was on pace to get over 10 sacks last season. So again, if you're limiting his snap count and he's able to just bring fire and brimstone on every single time he's on the field, if he's only on in third downs, he's going to get 10 sacks. And there was only 15 guys in the league last year that did that. Like, you know, it's Arik Armstead, it's Marcus Golden, it's Miles Garrett, it's Max Crosby. All those guys were tied at 15th at exactly 10 sacks. That's really damn hard to get when you look at all the pass rushers in the league. There's dozens of them. Mm-hmm. So, again, if he hits that number, somebody's going to pay him. And will it be 18? I don't know. Uh, you know, because, again, he's he's old. But it's it's going to be more than six. It's hmm. definitely going to be more than six. It'll, I would be even, double, it'll be double six if he gets double digits. Easily. Which then puts you right there with Robert Quinn, who's making a little over double in year two. So it's it's the same damn thing. You know, they're 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 going to be similar production. I think they're going to end up making similar money in 2021. So in terms of who got the best deal, I think the only reason why Dallas didn't keep Quinn is because, again, they're they're going to run out of money eventually and they haven't signed Dak yet. And next year, like they, they, they need to create space and having a contract like Quinn's on the books where they have to pay 14 million next year. They straight up did not. They weren't able to do that. I know we were talking earlier about how the cap is fake. Uh, it it, it is until to, it isn't. <laughs> it is until it isn't. Uh, and the thing is, the cap can be fake as long as your quarterback is already under contract. Theirs yes. is not. Theirs is not yeah, under that contract. That is the wild yet. card in, in team construction is, yeah. do, you, do you have a young quarterback? And if so, for how many more years? Or what are you able to get away with paying a veteran quarterback? And as we all know, that market pretty much sets itself and is always, quote unquote, higher than fans would like it to be. Oh, they're paying that guy, you know, blank million a year. Yeah, well, that means he's the 13th highest paid quarterback. It's not that much. And it goes down every year. Uh, Very common misperception. But that is the, the position in team building. And there are, you know, two separate windows right there is your window if you get lucky enough to draft a young quarterback and have him be very effective and there is the window after that if you want to keep that stability in the building and you have to sign him to the big dollar contract things shift very substantively at that point on that deal yeah so that's that's really why they were prioritizing a guy like griffin that they could get for one year because they they needed the space in 2021 they could not have another pass rusher on the books next season because they I mean, they're going to have to make some some really hard decisions next year just to fit Dak in the first place um like they can do it it's possible but the more guys you sign the less likely it becomes that it that it's doable so again and it's given that I'm going to flip it back to you because we talked about this even in our uh draft review and, and kind of season preview episodes Knowing that Dallas is sort of up against it for two years, why does a team like the Seahawks not front load a two-year deal and make it attractive for a guy like Everson Griffin to come to the Northwest? Because as much as Everson Griffin fits Dallas's system, man, he's in lockstep with what the Hawks need at edge and really don't have. So why do the Hawks not do that deal? I truly don't know because they have 15 million right now. And next year, it's got over 50 million. And the year after that, they've got, you know, they're like top eight in projected cap space. Like, even with Russell already on the books, they've got a lot of money. And this is even before Jamal's signing. Like, that's the only reason I can think of is maybe they think they're going to have to give Jamal, you know, 18 plus, which is not out of the realm of possibility. Like maybe they think that's what what it's going to cost, and so they want to roll over the fifteen to next year and make it so they have like seventy million, and then just front load the shit out of that deal. Maybe that's that's all I can really think of. Like because a team with fifteen million that needs defensive line that isn't signing Everson Griffin and isn't signing Jadavian Clowney, 
there's something going on there. And I think it must have something to do with them trying to preserve as much money as possible for Jamal Adams. Cause I, I truly cannot think of any other reason. Either that or it's just wild faith in LJ Collier. Oh, Lord help him. If that's the reason <laughs> I, I feel like I got to start a prayer circle for that one. Cause if that is the reason, oof, RIP Hawks fans. Ah, uh, they'll be fine one way or another. They've got a very good defense, but a piece like Griffin really would have put him over the top. And it just seems like you said from the outside, I don't want to say indefensible because that's a little bit strong. And, and John Schneider certainly earned uh, his benefit of the doubt, but it does seem odd that uh, guys available for well under 10 million, basically just over half of 10 million a year, you've got 15 sitting there. You could easily price the Cowboys out because they cannot compete into next year salary cap wise without their quarterback situation settled. You could front load a deal. You could have made it eight and a half million this year, you know, guarantee that fully and, you know, backload it with a second option year deal. It would have been very easy to outprice the Cowboys with all the cap space you mentioned that the Hawks have, and they have a dire need for edge pass rush. Uh, their defensive tackles are fairly well set. Clowney is in the wind at this moment. And here's Everson Griffin, a guy with power that fits that role that they have almost defined in the league over the last four years. And they don't snag him. Very, very odd choice by uh, my local team here in the Pacific Northwest. But um, you know, in John Schneider, they trust and we shall see, but it just seemed odd. And I know that was one of the first thoughts on your mind when he signed with Dallas. Yeah, that was the first text I sent you was, yep. <laughs> why the hell did Seattle not do this? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I we, we may never know, but... Nope, nope. As with many things with the Hawks and player, uh, both evaluation and acquisition, but great job on the Adams thing, head scratcher on the Griffin thing. I, you know, I'm still leaning in the camp of that, you know, John Schneider's got his genius moves going so far. Um, so... We shall see, but uh, odd they didn't pick him up, especially at, at that kind of discount, because he is still a very productive player. It is it is not one of those guys who is clearly declining and they're signing him for name value or something else. He is a guy that can stir the drink on a pass rush pretty regularly as long as you don't run him into seven or 800 snaps. Yeah, 100%. Uh, but anyway, uh, what do you say we get out of here? Because I uh, We should I, do that. I'm, I'm about done with my Manhattan, which means I need to go get number two. Ooh. And uh, hopefully we can get out of here and get this show released before some more major contracts get signed because I feel like we're not done yet. But uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in for this week's show. We'll be back uh, sometime next week. You know, we don't really have a set schedule yet. I know. Eventually we will. We're really bad at this whole, you know, responsible podcaster thing. But we'll get there eventually. And we also have some other huge really cool stuff in the works that uh i me and ej are giddy over that we can't wait to show oh, you it's, it's coming so it's cool. really close uh we've got some visual stuff working for bootleg and uh we are really really excited we've we've seen some of the early designs and we'll just keep it at that um plenty of good more summer content coming for you on the bootleg football podcast uh until then stay safe and we will talk to you soon Later.